To all you dads, happy Father's Day. And I know for years, years and years and years, I desire to be a father. And those who know me long enough know that, you know, I was one of those guys, my wife couldn't have kids. And so for years, you know, Father's Day would come and go and and, and my prayer would be, I'd say, God, I would really like to have a kid call me daddy one day. You know, I was getting older at this point. You know, not as old as Abraham, but I was getting older. <laughs> and, and I'm like, God, I really want to be able to be a father. I really want to have a kid, you know, call me daddy one day. And for years I prayed that. And Debbie and I, for those, most some of you that can remember back, you know, to Debbie... Uh, she died when Samuel was two. And we prayed many, many years. In fact, 17 years to have a child. 17 years. Doesn't sound, that was a long time to me. Because every year I'm thinking, you know, this will be the day. You know, this will be the year that, that it happens. You know, there was, there was another lady in the Bible that she wanted a child. In fact, there were, if you look in the Bible, there are a lot of women that were barren. Are you listening to me? There were a lot of women in the Bible that were barren. A lot. Especially, listen, especially when there was something important about the kid. Especially that. But there was a lot of those godly old women that, that could not have children, at least for a season. And there was this lady called Hannah, and year after year she prayed for a child, and she never got pregnant. And so finally she changed her prayer, and that, that's what happens a lot of times when we go through the barren stage in a lot of ways. Hannah changed her prayer. And she said, God, if you will give me a child, I will give that child back to you. And you know, we think about that old baby dedication. We lift them up and God, we ask you, we give that child to you for whatever. <laughs> and you know, Hannah was different. Hannah said, I will literally give the child that I've been waiting for for years to you. And she got pregnant. After she prayed that prayer, she got pregnant. She went home and had the baby, weaned the child, brought the baby back to the preacher <laughs> of that day, the priest, Eli, and she gave him her kid. He became probably one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. I heard one of my professors in seminary say that, he said, you know, all the... You know, the guys of old, all of them made their mistakes. You know, Dave, you can go back, David, Abraham, all of them. He said, but you never hear a bad word about Samuel. You think about it. He was an amazing man of God. Amazing man of God. And so, for 17 years, uh, Debbie and I began to pray for a child. And in the year 2000, Somebody wrote us a letter, and I think I remember who it was, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say the name. But they wrote us, and they said they really felt like God said we were going to have a kid. This was back in 2000. Remember, there was no kid at that point. It was, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're about to get to the point like Sarah and not, <laughs> you know, not be able to have kids. And so, okay. And then, that was October of 2000. Then in November of 2000, I went to get a Christmas tree at Food Lion. Because at that time, we had a real tree. And I went to Food Lion. They had the trees outside, and there was a gray-headed lady there. I mean, she wasn't that old. But she had, I remember she had gray hair. It was short, about like this, straight. And because I kept looking for her to see if I'd ever see her again. And I've never seen her again. But she looked at me, and she said, I guess you have children to take that tree home to. I mean, just a, just a stranger out of the blue talking to me. And I said, no, we don't have any kids. I said, we want kids, but we don't have them. And she began to prophesy to me 
about having a child. And I'm like, I mean, I, I was flabbergasted. <laughs> I mean, she literally, I mean, I don't know if she knew she was prophesying, but I, I could tell by the way she was speaking through her voice, it was prophetic from God. And she looked at me and she said, there's a child out there for you to adopt. And I'm like, okay. Maybe she's listening by Facebook. I don't know. I haven't seen her in 20-some years. That was December of 2000. And then my wife was a dental hygienist, and she went to work one day, and a patient came in, and she said a patient did the very same thing that the lady at Food Line did to me. She began to prophesy to her about having a child. Like, whoa, this is three times in just over a month. And we had wanted, we had really wanted children a lot. And so, and I can't remember the song, but I know there was some kind of CD that my wife had. Or maybe it was cassette back then, I don't know. And somebody had written a song, and I think it was a secular song about how if they had a child, they would show them everything. And... I don't remember the song, but I remember it was something that she picked up. I think it was a secular song because we didn't, we didn't listen to secular music. I mean, it was just our choice. We didn't do it. And so she threw the CD away, or whatever it was. And I don't, you know, my timing may be off in this, okay? You know, we're talking, <laughs> we're talking 20-some years ago. And so that was about the time that all the prophetic words began to come. And after she threw that away, I don't know whether it was that when God was when God spoke to her, but she went to the dumpster, and we, we lived in an apartment, not like a, a townhome complex. We had those big dumpsters outside. It wasn't like going through our trash. She had to go through everybody's trash. And she dug out that CD. Because we knew that God was doing something. Are you, are you with me? We knew, because... Something was happening that was beyond us. It was totally beyond us. And so she went and dug it out. All right, so all this happened October, mine in November, and I think hers was December of 2000. January the 6th of 2001, I get a phone call. And it was from a lady, a pastor's wife, I had not heard from in five years. In fact, they lived in Pennsylvania, and we just, we'd lost contact. She calls me up five years later, and she said, there's a girl in our, that used to be in our church, and she's 19 years old, and she's had a baby, and she's out of wedlock, and she wants me to find Christian parents for her kid. And I, I was like, I, 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 Debbie picked the phone up. She said, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, it was really, it was amazing. And so after that, after, after January the 6th, I don't know, it was pretty soon, we made a trip up to Pennsylvania. And I don't where Samuel, is Samuel in here? Uh, <laughs> but we we made <laughs> we made a trip to Pennsylvania, and at this point, she he was born in in May, so she was about halfway along, a little bit over halfway, and we were able to meet his birth mom, meet the birth grandparents, and there he was in her belly. I mean, we I got to you know touch him even while she was in her belly, and uh, but her. You know, she wasn't really walking from God, but she came from a godly family. All right, I don't know if you missed that or not. She was not really following God, but she came from a very godly family. And because of her roots, she wanted and chose Christian parents. Are you with me? You know, sometimes we, you know, we don't know where thing, you know, what really has taken effect in our kids' lives. But she chose Christian parents. 
even though she wasn't walking with God. And so while we were up there, met the grandparents, and the, grand, the grandfather, he was actually the step-grandfather, he, uh, he told me, he, you know, we, we spent some time with him, but God, the Christian people. He told me, he said, you know, this name keeps coming to me. Samuel. <laughs> and all, when he spoke it, it's like, pow, inside. Yes, that's it. And so his birth grandfather actually named him, not me. Uh, and we related a lot to this story of Hannah in the Bible who couldn't have a child. And ha listen to this. Hannah took her child and brought her child to the preacher's house and said, you raised my kid. It, isn't that cool? And so 17 years we had prayed. Now, you know, with, with adopted children, you know, a lot of times they go through things that others don't. And I'm just very thankful that God worked Samuel through everything. I mean, it's just because it doesn't always happen that way. Amen? All right, but I will tell you, we, you know, tonight Samuel and I are going to a concert in Portsmouth. Now, he mentioned this concert to me, and there's four different bands, I mean big bands. If I tell you the names, you know, 90% of you know who they are. Uh, and he said, Dad, he said, I'd like, you know, maybe we can go. And I said, okay, it was going to be hard for me because I, it took a lot of effort for me to make sure my mom was taken care of. It took a lot of finances to make sure we hired somebody to be there with her. But I made it happen for my son. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, the bond between me and that boy, I believe, is thicker than blood. Listen. Oh, you hadn't heard the good part yet. That's not even the good part. And so I told my sister, and I'm sorry, but I said, but I need to do this for Samuel. And she's like, okay, we'll work it out. And we worked it out. I said, but i got to do it for my son. And then yesterday I was talking to my son. He was talking about the concert, and he says, Dad, I, I don't know what brought it up. He said, Dad, I wouldn't even gone if it wasn't for you. He said, he says, I'm doing this because I know you, that's one of your favorite songs, the band. He said, that's why I want to go. And, and you know, when you look at all that, I believe that the bond that God has put between me and my son is thicker than blood. You know, I go to extraordinary efforts to bless him, but he goes to extraordinary efforts to bless me. You know, I look at him and I look at, you know, what most of the kids go through in this world. He never went through rebellion. I mean, you know, he ain't perfect, okay? He ain't perfect at all. But he never went through the teenage rebellion. He never went off in the world. He never ran off in the world about sex, drugs, and all that, women, all that. He never did it and still hasn't done it to this day. Still hasn't done it. Now... Understand, that's God. That's not me. <laughs> that's God. All right, now. Now, I want to I talk to you about a few things. Years ago, I read a book. You know, there are certain things in my life that have been transforming to me. When I teach the class next door, a lot of the things I teach, and I'll tell you before I do it, this is something that transformed my life. And I'm taking that and I'm giving it to you. Something that I may have gone through the hard knocks to learn. I'm just giving it to you. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And so this book that I read, it was, it was 20 some years ago. It was one of those that really had a transforming effect on my life. Some of you who are older may remember it. It was by a guy by the name of Stephen Covey. And he had seven habits of highly effective people. 
And so I read this book, and one of the, the main points in it was, begin with the end in mind. If you've read that book, you remember, you remember that. It, you begin with the end in mind. And even now, you know, people still say that statement. You begin, you know, business executives, they, they will tell you, you begin with the end in mind. In other words, you think when you start something, you think about what you want at the end of it before you ever start. Are you with me? In other words, you plan, you think, this is what I want to see happen. This is what I want to see develop. And then, everything along the way is decisions to make that happen. But you begin with a picture of what you desire before you ever start. All right, during this time, during this time of barrenness, when Debbie was barren, when she had no child, I mean, we both really sought God a lot. We prayed a lot, God, to help her get pregnant. Well, that, didn't, that won't work. And it never worked, okay? And that's fine. But during that time, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed about, I mean, we started praying about how to be good parents, how to be godly parents. I mean, we went through the whole Bible studying all this about our relationship with each other. What does that need to be? And for years before he ever came into existence, before we ever knew we were going to have him, we had spent years studying this stuff, cataloging it about what we would need to do if God gave us a child beginning with the end in mind. But along the way, my prayers began to change. And before he was ever born, and I'll show you a scripture I'm going to use in, in a few minutes. Now, actually, I'm supposed to already have shown you that. Let's go to... Sorry. All right. As, as I was in this time of barrenness, there was one particular scripture that literally changed my life. Oh, did you hear what I said? I mean, if I, I don't tell you that often, but when I tell you that, it's something that was powerful to me. When I tell you grace changed my life, I mean it changed my life, and I get excited about it because I know the power of it. When I talk about the deity of Jesus, how it changed my life, when I found that out, it did change it. And I, the, the power of it was amazing. And this scripture, oh, this scripture did the same thing. In Malachi chapter 2, and give you just a little bit of background before I get into it, Malachi is talking to married people. He's talking to couples, and he's talking to them about the marriage relationship. And he's talking about the marriage relationship being one. How you're two people and you come together as one person. Even Jesus said it. He said, the two shall become flesh. Well, Malachi talked about that in the Old Testament. I want you to look at what he said. Malachi 2 verse 14. Yet she is your companion and the wife, your wife by covenant. You see, he's talking about the marriage relationship. But he did not... But did he not make them one? Sorry about that. But did he not make them one? Didn't he make them one? Talking about the marriage, husband and wife. Didn't he bring husband and, together and wife together as one? Didn't he do that? Didn't God do that? Didn't God take two people and bring them together as one person in marriage? You see, Malachi is going to talk about the purpose of marriage. Because what we're taught and everybody believes is, why do you get married? Because you find somebody you love. You want to spend your life with them. Yes, and that's part of it. But scripturally, that's not the main part. It's, part, it's, a by, it's really a byproduct of what we're doing. Now, here it says next, why one? Why did God make man and woman one? Why did he do that? Don't you like being in suspension? I like you being in suspension because I know when you see it, 
it's going to grab you. So Malachi 2, 14 and 15 says, there's a reason why God took man and woman and he made them one. Now look at this. He seeks godly offspring. And I'm telling you, in our time of barrenness, I read this scripture, and I'm like, God, and I, and I told God, I said, listen to me, you think, I'm, I'm, you think I'm joking, I'm not. My wife could not have kids, but I got on my face before God after reading that scripture, and I said, God, I would ne rather never, ever, ever have a child call me daddy if that kid's not going to follow you. Now, that's serious stuff, but I'm telling you, that's what I prayed. And I'm not saying everybody can pray that. I said, God, this is how serious I am about it. This is how serious. Because I believe that there was power in that scripture that literally changed my life. And so my prayers began to change again. During that time. I used to pray, God, make me a godly father. Which is a, a viable prayer, right? Lord, make me a viable, you know, make me a, a good father. Make me a godly father. And my prayers began to change because <laughs> it was really backwards. It's not a bad prayer, but it's backwards. And my prayer changed. And what I began to pray was, God, help me to raise a godly kid. And I'm telling you what, that will change the way you parent. Because sometimes, yeah, you know, see, you know, Father, man, you know, listen to this, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize this a little. You know, God, I know I'm a bad dad, but God, make me a God, more godly father. And nothing ever changes in our life. And so my prayers began to change. And I said, God, I want you to show me how to raise a godly kid because I know that's what you want. If you give me a kid, I would rather not have him if he's not going to serve you. So God, give me godly offspring. Give me godly offspring. Now, I want to say this here, and I want you to understand. I started early. Most of us started too late. I've seen too many, I've seen a lot of parents that once they get the concept of what's going on, I mean, their kids are, <laughs> their kids are already gone off doing their own thing. Or well, maybe the kids are getting older. You know, I talked about in the beginning about the abracadabra. You know, abracadabra and the bunny comes out of the hat. And I think that's the way sometimes we look at parenting. You know, God, abracadabra, let me have a, a, a child that loves God. You see, what happened is, once I learned that scripture, it directed my steps for the next 18 years. That scripture. That scripture literally directed my steps for 18 years. And that's how serious I took it. Now, if you're at a point and your kids are not where they need to be, then you can't go back and change anything. All you do is you start where you're at and you try to and you do what you can for the future. Do you understand what I'm saying? There the Bible says there's no condemnation from God. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. This is not about condemnation. It's about telling you a success story so that God can do something in each of our lives. You know, if I was able to, if my wife was able to get pregnant in the very beginning, I, our kid may not have turned out the way he did. I don't know. 
But my prayer began to change, and I began to pray, not God make me a godly father, but God show me how to produce a godly offspring. You know, God, show me how to trust you to do this. Now, recently, I talked to a man, and he was dating a girl out of town. And when I talked to him, he said, the girl I used to date. I said, used to date? Come on, what's, what's going on? Did you break up with her? He said, yes, we decided to just be friends. I'm like, okay. I said, why? I mean, this is not a young kid. I'm talking about somebody <laughs> probably my age. I said, why? He said, because we got to a point. I want you to listen to this. He said, we got to a point that we realized our understanding of level of spirituality was not compatible. I mean, I don't know his exact words, but that's what it came to. See, he is a dedicated, committed Christian. Everything. He said, our level of spirituality was not, <laughs> we won't see in the same thing. But he broke up with his girlfriend, and I could t even when he told me, I could feel his pain. He still likes the girl. But listen to me, he broke up with her because of her level of spirituality. You know, my son, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't say a lot about girls as Samuel was coming up. I mean, yes, I mean, I did say a lot. Uh, maybe I said a lot more than I realized. I mean, even when it came to the birds and the bees, I said, son, I don't care what your question is, your dad is going to be here, and I will answer it, whether I like it or not. And I did. I had come up with some doozies. <laughs> but I made a promise to him, I will never turn him away for anything he asks. Anything. And there were some doozies. All right, so, uh, so anyway, Samuel got to a point that he started noticing girls more. You know, this is back mid-teenage years. He began to notice girls more. And so, you know, we started talking about girls because we've always had a very open relationship. So we started talking about girls. And I told him, and he, he's here to vouch for it, I told him one day, I, I never told him a lot, or maybe, well, maybe I told him more than I realized it, but I said, Samuel, I said, listen to me. I said, I know you're starting to like girls. I said, but buddy, don't you dare bring her home to me if she don't love Jesus with her whole heart. I don't care. If she don't love Jesus with everything and with her, I do not want to meet her. Don't bring her home. Some of you think maybe I, listen, I was dead serious. Because I, it's not only about me producing godly offspring, it's about him producing godly offspring. And so, you know, that was back mid-teenage years, so he's, you know, with kids, you sort of give them what you think is right, but then they get to a point, they've got to make their own decisions. And unfortunately... Many don't make the right decisions. So anyway, and sometimes, you know, we just, we don't know at the time we speak. And so, time went along. And Samuel started noticing girls more. And one day he started talking to me. And, and, and we would, and, and this is probably my fault. Sometimes I would go up to him and, and because he's never had a girlfriend. Sorry, bud. He's never had a girlfriend. And it's not because he can't. He's had a lot of girls could have been his girlfriend. But he's chosen not to. And if you ask him, he'll tell you. Because he's waiting for the one that God has for him. And what... And listen, what... And listen, he told me one day. 
you know, this is, you know, a while after I'd said what I said, and you wonder how well it takes with a kid. And, you know, we're talking to him about girls, and sometimes I push him, hey, Sam, she's sort of cute. And he just, he plays it cool. And he said, Dad, what I do is, he said, I sit back and watch. And he says, I watch her, and I listen to what comes out of her mouth, and I look, and I look at her level of spirituality before I even think about anything else. I'm like, <laughs> God, I know that didn't come from me. I didn't teach him that. It's like he just got it. And so there was one girl that came up to him in chapel one day. He's sitting in chapel. He's going to Regent University. Came up, and a girl came up to him in chapel. And she's sort of cute, obviously. And... Uh, but they start talking, and it's like her level of spirituality is, oh, it's up here where he's looking for. And he was starting to sort of like her, and then he came to me a little while later. He said, Dad, she's got a boyfriend. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the thing of it is, just like with my other friend, he was looking for that level of spirituality. Now, you know, there... There are a lot of people that could be a lot better pants than I am. When Debbie died, I mean, I remember telling God specifically. Because I had a, when he died, he was, he was still in diapers when she died. And I told the Lord, I said, God, I said, if you need somebody to raise him, you pick the wrong one to take first. I said, one, she's a lot better parent than I am. I mean, she can just give him everything he needs. And I said, he's stuck with me. And I meant that. And not just her. I mean, there's a lot of people that are a lot better pants than I am. But you, you know what? You know, for one thing, I think he, he turned out the way he did first because of God. Because, listen... When we, when we make the right decisions, God pours out abundance on those right decisions. Do you understand what I'm saying? It won't all me. I could not do the things that He needed in His life. But I'm telling you, when I made that decision right there, God, I want God the offspring. I'm telling you, God, God threw His weight behind it. And you know, it's not been an easy road. But one thing we had was we had a goal and we had a plan. I had a goal, godly offspring. And I'm telling you what, it directed my life. Not just 18 years, 21 years. And we began to develop a plan how to do it. Even before Debbie died, we decided we were going to homeschool. And I thought, my gosh, when she died, the homeschooling deal died. And... Um, we moved back from Honduras. He was already having trouble in school. And I don't want to get into all that, but he was having some trouble in the school down there, even though it was a Christian school. We came back here, and I made up my mind, I'm getting back to the original plan. And so I went back, and, and I made the decision to homeschool again. All right, at this point, <laughs> at this point, I've become a stay-at-home dad. I mean, I'm beyond bachelor's degree. I'm in the master's degree. Never finished it. But I made a choice to stay at home with my son and there's no other income but mine. And people say, you know, Curry, how'd you make it? <laughs> we made it the best we could. The best we could. But you see, I had a goal in my mind of godly offspring, and I did whatever it took. Listen to me. I did whatever it took to help make that happen. Now, there's a lot of parents that can make it happen in public schools. Great. There's a lot of parents that make it great in Christian schools. Great. You do what works for you. Understand? You do what works for you. If you're watching by Facebook, you do what works for you. But for me... 
we had made the decision before he was born that homeschooling was going to be our choice. And it, and, it, and it wasn't because we thought the schooling was better. It wasn't. There was only one reason. The reason was we felt we'd have a better chance of producing God the offspring. Because He would be under our influence and under the influence of godly te- teachers that we chose and curriculum that we chose. He'd be surrounded by people that we chose. You know, even as Samuel came up, you know, he came up, he came, he entered his teenage years, and there was a point that I wasn't sure which way he was going to go. I mean, he probably don't even know this, but he was 12 when I moved back, and it, there was a little bit of iffiness in there. And Dad knew he had to buckle up and do whatever it took. Because I did not get my eyes off the goal. And so, yes, I homeschooled my son. Yes, I did it as a single parent. Yes, we were poor. I drove the same car for eight years. Got totally out of debt so I could homeschool my son because he needed it. We gave up anything that anybody could want because we had our eyes on a goal. And that goal was God the offspring. And for us, To me, I felt like homeschooling was the way to go. And even in that, I helped him choose friends. Because what I did is, I got him involved with people that were Christian, that had godly kids. You know, we came back, I introduced him to families that I knew and trusted, and I knew what they were giving their kids. So who became his friends? (laughs) Their kids. He needed social interaction. We went to a Christian homeschool group where all the kids are, are in Christian families. And he got his social interaction at a place of my choice. Plus what he has at church. And even once he got up to a part of youth group, we didn't have we had a, uh, a, a startup youth group at that point. And so I took him to the youth group at the church where I used to be a part of. And I made that trip every week. And I did it because I wanted a godly offspring. You know, I did not sacrifice for my kid. I want you to listen. I did not sacrifice for my kid. I sacrificed for my kid to be godly. And there's a big difference in that. Now, I believe that God is looking for godly offspring. Now, I don't know who's watching by Facebook. I don't know who's watching by YouTube because we we probably have, you know, younger mothers there. I'm telling you, God's not putting condemnation on anybody. And I'm not telling anybody what they need to do, but I'm telling you, if you will get a hold of that Scripture and you will ask God, listening by Facebook, you ask God, What is it going to take to produce godly offspring? You know, my son knows, and I've talked to him. I said, son, (laughs) yeah, you know, I like where you're at, but I want godly grandkids too. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I've laid the plan out before he ever started. But you know what? He bid on it because he knows it's best. Why do you think he's waiting for a godly young girl? <laughs> because, I, I mean, there, there was a point, we're talking about one girl, I don't know who it was, I said, son, do you want her to mother your kids? Half of the kids' influence come from her? Is that what you want? And then going back to the statement I made in the beginning, I said, son, don't bring them home. <laughs> All right, now. I want to finish up with this. If you're looking by Facebook and you're looking by YouTube, I'm telling you, again, you grab a hold of that scripture that God seeks godly offspring and you pray about what God wants to do in your life. You don't have to mimic me. You do what God desires you to do. I'm just telling you my story. 
And if you're here today and maybe you've got children, maybe you've got grandchildren, and, and, and I know a lot of times, you know, people look back and think, I would do it a whole lot different if I had to do it again. I was fortunate enough that I started before it ever started. And I saw the goal before I ever started. That's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful my wife was barren because I probably never would have never searched that scripture out unless she had been. And if you're here, you know, children are not where you want them to be, grandchildren are not where you want them to be, you know, God, God's a redeeming God. He's a redeeming God. And God will take you where you're at. And He'll help you get to where you want to be. You see, <laughs> I've already started praying, not just for my daughter-in-law. <laughs> and you may think I'm crazy. I prayed for Samuel before he was born. <laughs> I prayed for his wife before he was born. <laughs> you think I'm crazy. I prayed for his wife before he was ever born. And now I'm praying for his grandchildren before they're born. I know it hadn't been long ago I, I went through, I mean, I spent a long time with God, and I was, I was praying through children, grandchildren, all the way down to the fourth and fifth generation. Listen, I want them all clean. When I'm dead and gone, I want them clean with God. And I'm not talking about lay me down to sleep. I'm talking about really seeking God over generations. All right. My time is way past. Way past. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we thank you for it. And God, I thank you, Lord, that you gave grace. Father, that you gave grace. Father, I thank you that, God, you revealed the Scripture to me before I ever started. God, before I ever started. And Father, I pray for the people that are here. And God, I ask you, Lord, that God, that you would bless each person. God, that you would... Father, that you take each person where they're at. And God, that you would draw them to where you desire them to be. Father, I thank you for it. And God, I bless you. Amen. Yes. How do you raise godly children? Train up a child in the way they shall go. And when they grow old, they shall not depart from it. Hello? And by the way, probably the majority of friends that Samuel have are girls. He may not have a girlfriend, but he has a lot of friends who are girls. <laughs> In fact, if you see some of the pictures of Samuel, I, I mentioned to him one day, I said, Samuel, I said, all the pictures I see of you, you're surrounded with girls. <laughs> There's a reason for that. But I also know that he has also shared with me that what he is searching for first and what he, he wants to be a godly man. And he is asking for the right one. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming today.